And now we will uh, go on with uh, Dr. Edith Gill. Uh, Edith Gill is a teaching faculty at the Department of Political Science at the Open University of Israel in the MA program of Democratic Studies. She published several articles on the Holocaust and the Israeli society, teaching the Holocaust, collective memory, and Holocaust survivors in Israel. She is currently researching on the labor experiences throughout the war of the transport of Jewish laborers from Radom in Poland. This research has been supported by a grant from the Israeli Science Foundation. And her lecture will be uh, now, Extermission, Extermination Through Labor, a connecting pivot between the Holocaust and genocide. He did for you. In his book about the Nazi death marches, Daniel Blattman has argued that the death marches cannot be explained as the ultimate act of ideologically motivated murder within the framework, framework of the final solution due to the fact that the victims were no longer divided, divided along such clear lines as before. The victims of the final stage were no solely only Jews and in, mainly, and in many cases, not even mainly Jews. Therefore, Blattman has, has seen the death marches mainly as the last period of Nazi genocidal activity. In that vein, the last stage of the concentration camps, which preceded the death marches, it can be seen as the pivot between the final solution and other Nazi genocidal activities. In the last year of the war, the concentration camp system proliferated, became decentralized, and constantly transformed in accordance with existing military needs. The daily number of prisoners doubled. Uh, prisoners were often transported to other camps, and the number of satellite camps multiplied. In 1944, 588 new concentration camps were established. 310 of them have been created from July to October 1944. In the fall of 1942, Himmler ordered that all concentration camps in the Reich would be free of Jews. Because of shortage of labor, Hitler reversed his order in the spring of 1944. Thus, in the last year of the war, Jews made up the largest prisoner group in many of the concentration camps. It was the most fatal period for the camp's prisoners. Studies have attributed the high mortality rate to the Nazi policy of extermination through labor. They examined the policy by mainly focusing on labor conditions, which were dependent on a certain extent of the, Reich, of the racial hierarchy by, that the Nazis created. While German prisoners toiled in the lightest works, Jews have enslaved in the worst building jobs. The aim of this paper is to discuss the Nazi policy of extermination through labor by looking at certain social aspects in several concentration camps in the Reich. The paper will discuss the similarities and differences encountered by uh, Jewish and non-Jewish prisoners regarding provisions such as infrastructure, sanitation, clothing, food, and medical conditions in six concentration camps, which were satellite camps of Natzweiler and were part of two projects. Fahigen, Fahigen und Rinexigen, Hessenthal, and Kochendorf were part of the Jagerstab, uh, which was endeavor to protect armament factories from air bombings and increase fi uh, fighter airplane production. And Bisingen and Dautmergen were part of the Wuste operation to ensure fuel supply to the Reich. I study these concentration camps as part of my research about the experiences throughout the war of 2,187 Jewish slave laborers who were transferred in the summer of 1944 from Radom, Poland to Fahigen, and since mid-October to seven more concentration camps. When planning and building the concentration camps, the SS encountered difficulties in deploying an adequate number of guards. Even though the new concentration camps were small and included only between several dozen to about 2,000 prisoners, the rapid expansion and the fact that many building works involved transport tasks required massive manpower to guard them. 
Raising enough guards was sufficient to transport, prisoner, to transport prisoners to new concentration camps even they, when they were not fully constructed. This was the case in Fahigen, Unterinexigen, Kochendorf, and Biesingen. The preparation for building a Messerschmitt underground factory in the, in the quarry in Fahigen started in April. Foreign laborers slept in a school and in local residents' homes. They built barracks for building materials and sleeping barracks for themselves, for the project engineers, and for the guards of the planned concentration camp nearby. In July, the foreign workers started to build a concentration camp for 1,000 prisoners. It was incomplete in August when 2,187 Radom prisoners and their SS guards arrived. The next day, most prisoners were sent to toil in the quarry. Some were taken to complete the camp. Unter in Exigen, a concentration camp near Feigen, was populated in November. It was planned to house 800 prisoners in two sleeping barracks and a washing barrack. When the SS mustered 40 guards required to guard 500 prisoners, the 500 prisoners from Feigen were sent there. Only one sleeping barrack was ready. The first prisoners who were brought to build Biesingen and Kochendorf experienced even worse conditions. The only installations they found were a double barbed wire and several watchtowers. They had to sleep in tents. Unlike the first prisoners in Fahigen and Unterinexigen who were Polish Jews, those in Biesingen and Kochendorf were mostly non-Jewish underground fighters. 1,000 Poles captured during the Polish uprising in Warsaw were sent through Auschwitz to build the barracks for the prisoners in Bizigen. 653 Poles and French night and fog prisoners were the first to arrive to Kochendorf. The SS commander welcomed the 223 French prisoners declare, declaring, I quote, I don't like Jews, but I hate French even more. You are here to die. None of you will come alive from this camp. The prisoners in Kochendorf were part of five main national groups, Hungarian Jews, Poles, Russians, Polish Jews, and French. According to historian Klaus Rixinger, the death toll among the French was the highest, 37%. The Natzweiler main camp called for prisoners to wash their feet at least twice a week, but the order could not be fulfilled in the satellite camps because, inadequate sanitary because of inadequate sanitary facilities. In Feigen, a few wash basins and some toilets were constructed outside in the middle of the camp. Prisoners received a small quantity of soap and only washed themselves once every two months. In Dautmergen, and this is what you can see over there, this is a report from the physician. So in Dautmergen, until December, only one toilet facilities served between 1,800 to 2,000 prisoners. The camp did not even have running water. The situation in Bisiken was even worse. The head of the SS oil company who visited the camp in early December reported that the camp was built on an exceptionally wet meadow, and this is the document which was presented in the uh, uh, Paul trial at uh, Nuremberg. Um, the barracks in Bisingen were built without a solid base. The bare ground served as a floor and there were no paths throughout the camp. During the fall and winter of 1944, the area was completely flooded and it was, all the roads were underwater. The toilets were not sufficient and were located in a far distance from each other. It was extremely difficult to reach them when the camp was covered with mud. Ex-prisoner uh, Isaac Wasserstein wrote in his memoir, we did not have water to wash our faces in the morning. I washed my mouth with a substitute coffee I received for breakfast. I put clay on my finger and used it as a brush to clean my teeth. The lack of satisfactory sanitary facilities gave rise to stinging bugs and typhus epidemics throughout the camps. The concentration camps were overcrowded even by SS established norms. Feigen included six barracks, four sleeping barracks for 2,187 prisoners, a kitchen, and an infirmary. The prisoners were squeezed in three tire banks. In Biesingen and Dautmergen, 
there was a severe shortage of bunks and straw. On average, three, three prisoners shared one blanket. According to, Kurt Steinicke, to Dr. Kurt Steinicke, the SS physician in the Wuster camps, the lack of space prevented the prisoners who worked in arduous work to get a minimum rest. This added to contacting contagious diseases. The de dearth of proper clothing also contributed to severe health problems. Before entering Feigen, the Jewish slave laborers stopped at Bittingham where they were disinfected and received one set of clothing consisting of a striped shirt, trousers, a hat, and a pair of clothes. They wore them during work in the dusty quarry and during sleep at night. They could not wash or delouse them. Thus, after several weeks, the clothes and shoes were worn down and were filled with lice. When they were transferred to other camps, they went with their uh, tattered clothes. The lack of clothing, and especially shoes, affected work production. Eugene Butner, Kochendorf's commander, noted in several of his weekly reports the lack of sufficient clothes and shoes. He emphasized that working in a dirty environment without reasonable shoes debilitated prisoners' health and thus reduced work production. Dr. Steinicke claimed that in Bisingen and Dautmergen, 10% of the prisoners went to work barefoot. Many others had defect shoes. Prisoners suffered from scratches and became inflamed, which became inflamed into abscesses. This often caused blood infections, which resulted in 30% of the death toll in those camps. Jacob Goldman, who arrived at Bisingen from Feigen, testified that although he had very high fever, he could not be admitted to the infirmary as only prisoners with foot problems who could not work were treated there. In Hessenthal, the camp commander, August Weiling, wrote that he was shocked to see the clothing conditions of the Polish Jews who arrived to the camp. Most of them did not have underwear. Okay, he wrote, he, he urged his friend uh, to assist in getting hygienic supplies and needed outfits. He emphasized that when arriving, 120 of the 600 peer prisoners could not be used for work since half of them did not have shoes and the other half had shoes in very poor conditions. The situation deteriorated and after two weeks, 200 of the prisoners were not able to work because of the shortage of shoes. In most camps, prisoners remained with the same rugged clothes and shoes during the winter. Dr. Steinicke noted that having only one set prevented the prisoners from changing the wet clothes during the nights. And thus, their immune system weakened. Many prisoners became ill with influenza or pneumonia, and each illness caused about 10% of, of the death toll. Prisoners sewed, shoes, sewed shirts from blankets and covered their feet with cement sacks. However, if they were caught, they have been severely punished. As we figured out, inadequate sanitary conditions, overcrowding, and lack of blankets, clothes, and shoes affected all prisoners in the six concentration camps. Jewish prisoners encountered the same conditions as non-Jews. Nevertheless, Jewish prisoners often received less food than non-Jewish prisoners and had less access to medical treatment. The meager ratio and quality of food accentuated further intolerable conditions. In his book about the concentration camps, ex-prisoner Eugene Cogon noted this was even worse in the last year of the war. An examination of the food situation in the six concentration camps reveals situation typical to the newly established camps. The official ratio was like German civilians, a little more than 75% of the ratio required for a hardworking laborer. The prisoners did not receive these ratios. Ex-prisoner Shlomo Horvitz testified that in Feigen, prisoners received a daily portion of 200 grams of bread and watery soup with pieces of cabbage and beetroots. On Sundays, most of the meat and fat were taken by the SS. Thefts of food were prevalent in many concentration camps but were curtailed only after SS inspections. 
the large number of new concentration camps made this harder to control. In addition, thefts in the smaller camps led to even more malnutrition. Another problem related to the food distribution derived from the managing inexperience and lack of skills of, skills of the newly appointed SS commanders. In Feigen, there were days when prisoners did not get any food. And in Bisingen, prisoners did not get lunch. In the evenings, even the allotment of the insufficient food was not organized properly. The commandos, first to return from work, received some uh, soup. Those arriving later did not get even the skimpy servings. Isaac Wasserstein testified that there was often a siren during supper. The lights were turned off and the distribution of the food would cease. When the lights turned on, the distribution of food resumed. But occasionally, the guards would then gather the Jews in a separate row and would not give them any food. In Dautmergen, prisoners had no cooked food even in the winter. From late December, they received once an evening hot diluted soup. Not getting cooked food meant that the prisoners <coughs> did not get vital vitamins. In both camps, Jewish prisoners were deprived from supplements of milk and sugar given occasionally to German and Ukrainian prisoners. In most concentration camps, Jews received the toughest works and did not have contact with either forced or civilian laborers or with the local population who could give them something to eat. Feingen and Hessenthal were two exceptions. Until October, Feingen included only Jewish prisoners and Hessenthal was one of only three concentration camps in the Reich which had solely Jewish prisoners. In Feingen, about 30 workers worked in the Fonorat farm close by where they received food which they also took to family members and friends in the camp. In Hessenthal, several dozen of Jews worked in local establishments, establishments such as the shoemaker shop and in the local brewery. Others worked next to recruited high school students who left them their leftovers, and yet others toiled with civilian workers who gave them extra food. However, even those helpings did not always save the prisoners who confronted hard work and harsh living condition, as in the case of David Zeitlin, and he's the grandson of the famous Rabbi Aaron Zeitlin, who received on a regular basis from a Belgian engineer who worked with him uh, food. Even when Zeitlin got ill with typhus, Mr. Gustav, the Belgian engineer, sent him for five weeks food and medication, but Zeitlin did not survive. In 1942, when a shortage of a new workforce was imminent due to the military failures in the East, Himmler and Glucks, who was the head of the concentration camps division in the SS, instructed SS physicians to reduce the death rates of the prisoners as much as possible. Physician prisoners, including Jews, were allowed to treat their co-workers in a special barrack, the sick barrack, the Revere. In Hessenthal, two physicians and several aides treated the sick Jewish prisoners. And you can see on the right, this is the special band that the head physician had, and this is um, a card that he had with his picture. Um, however, in uh, Dautmergen, there were at least 20 Jewish prisoner physicians from Vilna. Uh, they were in the camp, and you can see here their picture. The picture was taken after the war, so that's why uh, they have, uh, some of them have uh, the arm bed. And those of you know, I, th oops. I think the, the Dvorzhetsky, the famous uh, physician and one of the first historians of the Holocaust was among them. I think it's the one on the right. Okay. Um, the physicians, in the Jewish physicians in Dautmergen were enslaved like the other prisoners. Jews were not uh, allowed to be hospitalized in the Revere. Chaim Golani testified that he had to pay in order to be admitted. The other patients in his room were Russians and mainly Roma. In Dautmergen, the death rate among the Jews was the highest. 
about 65% among the Jews from Vilna and 50% among the Jews from Radom. My conclusion, extermination through labor was not only murdering through hard labor per se, but also destroying through the living conditions in the concentration camps. Often, Jews and non-Jews suffered from the same lack of supplies. However, in some camps, the, the racial hierarchy dominated and Jews received less of the meager food and were denied access to medical conditions. <laughs>